for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. We are recording. Welcome to Society's Executive Training. My name is Daniel Hatfield. I'm the Society's Coordinator at Kent Union. Uh, we're going to give you just a quick introduction to the way that Society's Executive works and what you do. The training is going to be split up into three main sections. First one is going to be a general introduction to the weekly things Society's Executive does. Second, we're going to look at leadership and some of the skills involved in your position of leadership. And thirdly, we'll look at some general knowledge aspects that will be helpful when you're engaging with uh, other societies and other committees. 150 societies at Kent Union, which represents somewhere around 800 committee members. Uh, and that more or less represents about 4,500 members depending on the year. Um, that's what we're currently looking at, and you, as a body of 10 students, are going to be overseeing this, this massive amount of students and different kinds of things, um, ways we're supporting them and looking to engage them. So to start with, just some, a couple of the regular things uh, that we'll be doing. Um, first of all, we'll be supporting the, the five forums, so societies are split up into academic, professional and development, cultural, physical activity and performance, politics, religion and campaigning and special interest societies uh, and there are five of you that are forum reps and you each have your own individual group or forum um, of societies that you help to oversee and support. One of the ways that we support societies is through the ratification process. In short, this is the way that if students have, who are not currently part of any society and there are no societies on show that they want to be a part of, they can apply online, send in an application form uh, and set up their own society. Just so, a couple of things that we need for this, and this is one of the things we discuss regularly at meetings. Uh, groups will need three committee positions that are executive uh, and the basic ones are, are president, secretary and treasurer. You also need to have 10 people who are interested in your society. If you have an idea for a society but you're unable to build a leadership team and you're unable to gain interest from 10 people, then experience shows that you're unlikely to actually get that society set up and running. Uh, another key thing that we'll look at when we're deciding whether or not to ratify a society uh, is whether or not your idea is unique. The most important reason for this is that if your society idea overlaps with another one, that can create a conflict. And we want to be very careful that all of our societies work alongside synergistically with each other so that there's mutual benefit because they've got distinct visions and distinct ideas. Uh, we don't set up societies that are likely to have conflict, be doing the same things uh, and work against each other in terms of stealing members uh, and that kind of thing. So, other than ratification. Uh, next thing that we'll look at, and this is going to change a little bit next year, um, but if I just give you the general idea, we have a, a fund, a certain pot of money that is allocated in our annual budget, uh, which runs from the 1st of August to the 31st of July. Uh, and this pot of money is called the Development Fund. This year we had uh, £5,738 to allocate, uh, and we've currently allocated over 4,000. So the idea behind the development fund is that we'll give groups funds for anything that develops their society. By develops we mean not regular expenses, so not things like um, we need some to pay for a meal and then we'll go out and pay, need to pay for the meal next week and the week after, or uh, we want to run an event that we run every year but we just like the union to fund it this year. It's for something, for example, we're going to do a breaking new ground event that eventually will become self-sustaining, but we just need a bit more money for the first one. Um, or we need to buy a piece of equipment, so like the Paintball Society um, needed to purchase some paintball guns so that they could compete in certain competitions and they didn't have the funds to be able to do that. Um, so we provided them with a development fund so that they were able to, to purchase that piece of equipment. Um, one of the other things we look for is value. So in other words, has someone gone out and done the research to find the best possible cost 
and or if they just gone and found something that looks pretty expensive maybe a bit unreasonable but they've gone oh well we're not paying for it the union can pay for that so we just won't mind so um, we'll look for that are they getting value for money for the thing that they asked for and um, and then probably the final thing would be um, have they done any fundraising themselves so our overall aim with societies is that we want groups to be able to raise their own funds week on week, year on year, uh, through membership uh, and different ways, through events, through through selling merchandise, through running trips, uh, to be able to become self-sustainable because there are just too many groups to, to centrally fund. So the idea behind this one and asking groups to raise some money themselves is so that they get into the mindset of we're not just going to receive a handout, we also have to put in some hard work to raise some money for ourselves. So then we top that up um, to get them the amount that they need, uh, but they're also learning how to raise funds so that they don't just need another handout in the future, or another grant in the future. So um, looking at an overview of the year then, what a year might look like. Um, there are a number of different events that happen throughout the year. Uh, some of the key ones being International Showcase, where we get our, our physical activity and performance societies, particularly the dance societies, uh, but also some of the cultural groups as well, um, to perform on, on a stage. We had about 300 people come along and watch this year, uh, 11 different societies, and it was part of the World Fest week in March. Uh, we also have uh, an interfaith day that we run, get involved in. Um, this year we had multiple different speakers uh, from the chaplaincy at the university, uh, among other, other things. I believe the idea this year is, is we want to get more societies involved. So you get presidents of uh, Sikh society, the Islamic society, the Christian Union, uh, and so on and so forth. So that we can then again showcase our, our religious societies uh, and invest in the student experience through that. Um, there are a number of other events we do, Societies Awards, uh, as perhaps you're aware of, hopefully many of you have been along to the Societies Awards, uh, 60 Minute Takeover, where we get student societies to run hour-long seminars on, on a session that they're interested in running, uh, and things like that, and you'll have an opportunity to help run those events, and if um, you have the experience and, and the desire to do so, you may even want to take a lead on one of those events uh, later on. Probably the final one to mention is a new idea that we had this year that Tom Curry had, uh, and that was the Society's Networking Lab. So we ran two of those, one in Term 1 and one in Term 2. So all sorts of events and things to get involved with. Right. Uh, second part of session then, so that's kind of the overview of the regular stuff that, and the intro. Second part, looking at some leadership skills. So if you came along to my leadership training session during the committee training week, you will already have heard me go through this uh, in a lot more depth. So apologies for that, but here's just a summary of, of what I went through. There's an idea um, presented by a guy called John Maxwell called the five levels of leadership. And the idea goes like this. Every person starts on the position level of leadership, and that's what you all currently have. You'll have a position, you'll have a role, you'll have a title. And he defines leadership as influence. So it's the ability, ability to cause someone else to move in a certain direction that they wouldn't have moved in if it wasn't for you. Or to learn something that they wouldn't have learned if it wasn't for you. Or to experience something they wouldn't have experienced if you hadn't been there. So leadership is influence. And he says, some people say, I, I just became a leader. But they didn't really just become a leader. What they got was a leadership position. And they think that that's the end, that's the goal, and that they stop there. He says, but there are actually five levels of leadership. So you can keep going up and increasing in your influence, and incre increasing in your ability to, to impact people and create positive change. But there's a couple of things that we can do at the position level to kind of consolidate our leadership. The first one is character. Character. So in other words, the principle is people do what people see. 
if you say to someone, oh, I think you should, you should be more positive, but you say it in a very negative and critical way, and they see you going around and being quite critical, so forum reps, for example, when you run your forum meetings, you will have a decision about how to create that culture and that environment. And if you represent a, a judgmental, a critical, a negative uh, attitude and atmosphere, if you're asking for positive feedback, you're unlikely to get it because it's, it's jarring against what you're representing. So make sure that you, you do what you want people to see. Second thing to consolidate our, our influence in the position level is knowledge. And we'll come on to that a little bit more later as we look at some of the general areas of knowledge that you're going to need. But essentially, if at your forum meetings or in your liaison by email or whatever else with societies, they ask you questions and you say, I don't know, go and talk to Tom or Daniel, then they're going to end up bypassing you because you will have lost your influence with them. Whereas if you have a, a good basic general area of knowledge about how societies run and work and so on, the stuff that we're going to come on to in a minute, then that will help increase your influence so that you can um, engage with them better. So, we do what we want to see. We try and work on our character and grow in our areas of weakness. With our knowledge, we do our reading, hopefully listen to the end of this video, and grow in our sense of knowledge there. But there's more that we can do. The second level of leadership is permission. The key word there is relationship. At this level, people don't follow you because they have to, which is what level one is. People follow you because they want to, because they like you, because you're a likeable person. Because instead of being critical or negative, you're encouraging and you're, you're someone who listens, and you're someone who cares about them. So when people turn up at perhaps a meeting you're running or at an event that we put on, instead of being someone who just talks to their friends in a clicky fashion or to people who you already know, you make the effort to turn away, to speak to the newcomer, to ask them who they are, what society they're from, and be genuinely interested in what they have to say and who they are. And so by asking questions, by listening, by showing that you care, by being encouraging, uh, and pointing out good things that they do, then you grow in your leadership and your influence, and you come up to the second level of relationship. Third level of leadership, Key word is production. Production is about results. So in other words, once people have come along to your forum meeting, to an event that we run, to the, they've applied for the development fund or to be a new society, are they seeing any outcomes from those things? So if I came to a forum meeting, was it useful to me? Did I learn anything? Did I feel like I was heard and my feedback was appreciated? If it's to an event, was it a good experience? Was it well run? Was it, was it a positive thing for me to have engaged in? If I've applied to become a new society, is the feedback I get important and substantive feedback or do I feel like I've just been fobbed off? If I've just applied to the development fund, likewise, is the feedback I get positive feedback? Was it helpful um, if I haven't been successful in getting the development fund so that I can apply again? Or did I just get the fund and did I get my society set up and therefore was the result helpful? So on this level it's helpful to have clarity around a vision, perhaps you've got an idea for how you can benefit societies. If you get that idea clarified and focused then more likely you're going to be able to achieve the results of that vision. So that's something to think about. Fourth level people development. Keyword is reproduction. In other words, at the end of the year, is there someone within your forum, within your contacts, within your own society, who you've been investing in, who you've been taking with you along to the events that we're running? who you've been bringing along to the forum meetings, and who you've been connecting with relationally, who you've been inspiring as you've shared vision and talked about results, uh, and who you've been investing skills and knowledge and time into so that they can grow and they can develop as a person. You've been almost like a, a coach or a mentor to them. 
so that when it's your time to stand down at the end of the year, instead of us just having to email out everyone and start from scratch each year, because you've been taking the time to invest in someone, so then there's one, two, three people perhaps for each position already with some knowledge, already with some training, ready to step up and get involved and get engaged. Last but by no means least, level five, pinnacle. So the pinnacle isn't really a functional level of leadership. It's more people follow you because of who you are and what you represent. So it's, it's about who you've become because you've had a position, you've invested relationally in people, you've got a clear vision and you're starting to see that vision realized in results and because you've invested in people and raised up a team over time. And because you've done those things so consistently for so long, then people hear your name, they know who you are, what you represent and they want to follow you. So this level is not really something you're going to achieve in your time on the society's executive, but it's perhaps a goal that you can aim for so that when you leave university you will have developed these skills so that you can become this person in whatever job or company um, or vocation that you choose to pursue after you need. So that's the five levels of leadership. In the end of section two, part three, just some of the, the general knowledge things that, that you will need. So we're going to look at three areas of knowledge um, that groups need to know and that they will probably ask you questions about and that it's good to be prepared for. First one is just kind of general administration type stuff. So if, imagine for a moment someone comes to you and asks you where to go to book a room. What do you say? Well, the place where people book rooms is on the timetabling website. Uh, easiest way to find it, find it is just to Google University of Kent timetabling and it'll take them straight there. If they don't have the ability to book rooms, then that means that that's something that Kent Union does. So the University of Kent and Kent Union are separate organisations. The university owns all of the rooms, but Kent Union, so myself, is the one who gives society committee members the, the permission to book rooms at the university. So go to the university website, I'm the one who can give you permission if you don't have it already. Second thing um, we're going to look at is finance. Three main areas of finance, getting your money in, viewing your money once it's in, and taking money out. If groups um, don't know how to pay their money in, it's two simple ways. First one is cash, if they have it, and you just take that to Mandela reception, and they can pay their money straight in at Mandela, that'll be fine there. The second way, and this is more for if a group is receiving sponsorship uh, or larger amounts of money from a company, they can ask their coordinator, which is me, to send an invoice. So groups shouldn't send invoices themselves because then the company would have to send the money somewhere and groups aren't allowed to have external bank accounts. They have to ask me to send an invoice on their behalf so that when the company pays the money in, we can track it and we know that it's not just gone into the big Kent Union pot, but we can assign that money that they've received to their specific society account. Groups want to view money in their accounts, three ways they can do that. They can go to Mandela reception and ask for a, a printout or an email of their accounts. Then go to the Student Activities Centre reception. Likewise, ask for an email or for a printout of their accounts. And as a last ditch thing, they can also ask their coordinator, so me. But if they're able to do one of the first two, that's always preferable. Lastly, taking money out. So once they've got all their membership fees in their accounts, uh, which have gone into their main account, or perhaps they fundraised and that's gone into their suspense account. They need to get the money out. Three main ways you can do that. First one is an, is an advance. This is by filling out a blue form and writing the words cash advance at the top of that form. 
That means they can take money up to 100 pounds out without having to have any receipts or anything like that. So they can pay, say, a, a DJ or um, a, a restaurant or whatever ahead of time. But the maximum there is 100. Second way is reimbursement. And probably worth saying as well, once they've taken the cash out and paid the cash, they then have to bring the receipt back to Mandela within seven days. Second one, reimbursement. They've got a blue form, which is for anything up to 100 pounds. They fill it, they bring back the receipt once they've paid the money themselves with their own bank card um, or whatever. They bring in the blue form, I sign it off and put the relevant codes on, and then they go back to Mandela and get the cash. Second form of reimbursement is a green form. This is for anything over 100 pounds. They don't get um, cash for this. Instead, we transfer the money back directly into their bank account by bank account transfer. Blue and green forms can both be picked up from the reception desk at the Student Activity Centre. Thirdly and finally is invoice. This is really for any expense which is a particularly large amount of money uh, and the society members are unable to front the money themselves. The main thing that I want to point out with invoice is that it needs to have the word invoice written on it. You'd be surprised. Lots of people have emailed me um, with documents and they say, here's the invoice, but it has something like receipt written at the top or booking form written at the top. If it doesn't have the word invoice on it, then in terms of financial terms, it doesn't classify as a document which is requesting money. Second thing probably on this, the main thing that happens is people will send invoices to the University of Kent, and as I mentioned earlier, the University of Kent is a separate organisation. So the invoices need to have Kent Union written on them. For us it's also helpful if it's got the name of their society, so let's use Kent Classics and Archaeology as an example. Hey, Kent. If we just receive an invoice that says Kent Union on it, we might not know which society is meant to be paying this company. That it's difficult because we've got 150 societies, as I mentioned. So it's good to have both. The name of the society, C slash O, which means care of or courtesy of, uh, and Kent Union, because that's the name on our bank account. It needs to have Kent Union on it, otherwise we can't pay it. So, that's a bit about admin, a bit about finance. Thirdly and finally, health and safety. So we ask all groups to fill out a risk assessment. This forms in, falls into two categories. Firstly, we need a generic one. And this is for the whole year. We don't want risk assessments to become a boring or pointless or irrelevant paperwork exercise. We want risk assessments to be something that actually is a helpful planning document that helps keep your members safe. Um, so although I have had some funny ones over time, so Magic Society, for example, sent one through that said things like, oh, we can tell you how we're going to do that trick, but then we'd have to kill you, uh, and things that are kind of quite amusing like that, but not particularly useful. Uh, they also mentioned about people getting paper cuts on playing cards, or like dropping packs of cards on their toes and bruising them. Quite amusing, but completely irrelevant. Paper cuts and things like that is not what we're looking for from risk assessments. A generic annual one, we're looking for things like, let's say the group has a committee meeting uh, that finishes 10, 10.30 at night in a seminar room in a remote part of the campus uh, and someone has an epileptic fit, goes into anaphylactic shock, has an allergic reaction, um, or perhaps there's, there's sort of a, a creepy guy hanging around the room and you've just got one or two female committee members left in the room. Um, what do you do in those kind of either medical or security type situations? So the simple thing we want groups to put on a risk assessment would be Campus Watch's phone number, um, which is 823300. So there's a generic one for, for risks like that, medical, um, emergency, security. Uh, we're looking at fire when you're in rooms so they know where the fire exits are. Um, we're looking at social, so alcohol consumption, are you advising groups um, to walk home in pairs, 
uh, to have a designated sober person, all that kind of stuff. And there's a form generically on the volunteer resources page on the Kent Union website. Really, really worth worthwhile knowing. So the website, kentunion.co.uk, and then forward slash volunteer dash resources. That's where your new society application forms are, development fund application forms, the volunteer handbook, which has all the information I'm telling you right now in it for a refresher, um, constitutions, and basically anything and everything will be there. And specifically for what we're talking about right now, the risk assessment template and how to fill it out also on that website. The only other one that we ask groups to do is if they've got a specific event. So in other words, if there are risks involved in an event or a trip that you're doing that don't fall under your generic risk assessment, only then do you have to do a separate one. Trip in particular uh, involves putting together a trip list and that can be picked up from Student Activities Centre or from Campus Watch. That will list everyone who's going on the trip and their emergency contact details in case, God forbid, something, something dreadful happens on that trip. So those are just a couple of basic things. There'll be lots more of info in the volunteer handbook, which you can find on that web address. Strongly recommend that you read uh, it. One thing that um, I forgot to mention under the admin section, so we said about, about room booking as one big bit of admin. Uh, one of the other things that we've been working on is a standardized elections process. So we want all society's elections to go online. The reason that this is, is good, uh, multiple reasons, uh, but just a couple. First, it helps streamline all of our administrative processes. So instead of me having to input manually all of people's administrative rights so they can get into their society webpage and the admin area and doing that one by one for 800 people, we can ask our databasing company to, to run a script so that they all get done at once. It enables us to look at the year in a developmental way. So we know everyone in society has a new committee at this point in time. So then the next training we can do, we can really focus on you're a new committee member, we can give you training that's specific to not really knowing what you're doing yet, and then throughout the rest of the year we can build developmentally on that. Uh, and lastly, really significantly, we can also track which societies are active and which societies have become inactive before the summer so that we can actually proactively engage. So what was happening before was we'd reach uh, July, August time, we'd do an audit of societies realised some had become inactive because they had all third year committee and then had left and there was nothing that we could do. Now, with standardised elections uh, around the end of March, beginning of April time, we know which societies are active and which aren't much earlier, whilst committees are still around but maybe haven't found someone to hand over to, so then we can engage with them and start helping them out in how to find a new committee so that their society keeps going. So I really hope you, you buy into the idea of standardised elections and can help put that message out to your own societies uh, and to your forums and to the students that you have contact with because uh, it will be a really helpful and exciting way of growing society. I hope that that training was helpful. Thank you. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. I mean the bare necessities or Mother Nature's recipes that bring the bare necessities of life. Wherever I wander, wherever I roam, I couldn't be.